Welcome, everybody, to Colonel Block 9, Module 2, Fireside on the Global Financial System. Really grateful to have everyone here. We are super excited to be joined by Maggie Love from SheFi today, and we are going to introduce her in a bit. Um, but we want to do, as we always do, a bit of an introduction to just kind of like where we are in Colonel what's going on in this module and kind of set the stage for our guest of the week. But Maggie, always great to be with you and really grateful you're taking the time to help us uh, treat this module well. The global financial system is a very tricky module. Uh, it sits near the beginning of kernel uh, for good reason, because it will take us a long time to kind of like unpack what happens here. Um, but what I want to start with always is just like, okay, like who's around in KB9? We're starting to learn more and more about the answer to that question with the way that people are sharing crafts and the ideas that are coming through in the unconference and now in office hours, you have people now sharing the different roles that they're looking at, the different projects that they're working on. And I just encourage you, if you haven't for a bit, to take a look at the kernel office hours and crafts channel uh, to get a more recent lay of the land of like, who is this group and what are they actively working on? Um, and what are the ways that we might be able to actively work with each other? Um, for Maggie's benefit, I think there are probably at least seven or eight folks from the Shifai group here. It could be even more, um, but just in general, a great group that we're really lucky to be with for KB9. And our hope today is that we are able to ask some good questions about the state of the global financial system and learn a little bit about it together. Um, the two principles of the week that we kind of are poking at, the number one is, is like the importance of asking better questions, like where that uh, line of inquiry comes from and then the idea that like money and speech are starting to intertwine in ways that we are still grappling with uh with blockchains so i'll start with better questions because it's where i hope this hour leads us um i love the first one the most simple seemingly silly questions are almost always the most profound um, good questions must come from a sincere desire to learn. Experts rarely ask good questions. Be a beginner, always. And then I like the ones where it says questions are an opportunity to be humbled, which I think is sometimes considered a bad thing, but but we don't think so. And um, we have this Figma board. The whiteboard is intended to be a place for your questions, for your scrap notes, for any ideas that you want to share. Um, it's for anyone who wants to join. Uh, I put the link in the chat. Maybe somebody can add it again. And uh, Trap Crypto, who was with us for like kind of the small group yesterday, the Learn Track Junto on the topic, uh, he wrote the the long version. Questions are an opportunity to be humbled. Asking good questions is in indistinguishable from practicing humility. Um, when we look at the global financial system, it very quickly can humble us. I was trying to prepare for this week's fireside and I was like, oh my God, there's so many topics. There's so many things that we can cover. And I think we'll get by with a little help from each other and our friends. Um, I'll continue with a bit more on money and speech. We're then going to go into the global financial system uh, with some takes from Balaji Srinivasan that just came out this last week. Um, it seems very possible that we'll have him joining us early next week in Colonel to talk about his article and his recent thoughts. But we want to start broad uh, 
without really poking in too much to what's going on in the crypto space and then narrow back in on that quite quickly. We'll have Alokic from Circle, who is in, I believe, KB5, uh, joining in a few minutes. And then Benga, who's with us in KB9, who's working on a stablecoin related projects. Just talk about stablecoin adoption as a, as a means of going from the global back into what's going on in the crypto space. And then we'll use all of that context to just kind of like take a breath maybe spend a bit bit of time with Maggie just exploring, okay, like what is this whole DeFi thing? How does it fit within this context? Um, what are the open financial systems that we're we're kind of like hoping for? And and what is what has her work uh, been towards that effort, which is uh which is making a, a really big dent um and, and is something that we're really grateful for on kernel. So I'll start um with just a bit on money and speech, um, this one is uh, is a tricky one, honestly, even for me. I've read it uh, from Andy like a few different times, and the the general premise here is that like money is changing, um, and that the ability to write smart contracts onto global. Sorry ledger uh, is one that suggests that we can come back up with weirder forms of of money. Um, and the word weird here is used to to kind of harken back to the roots of the word, which weird and wizard uh, ha happen to share the same roots. And this idea of like magic internet money has started to poke around uh, for some time. And so like in, in current times, uh, you could look at things like poly market as maybe a, an example of this, where you have um, these prediction markets that are, yes, about how money is being moved, but also ultimately about speech and, and truth and information. And there are other weirder forms of money that are referenced in this, this article uh, and nothing new under the sun. Um, so what it tries to go back to in this module is not only um, like what's new and what's weird, but also what, what's really old. Um, and so money as a form of obligation, not as an asset to be collected is starting point for money in large part. Um, and debt, especially in the early years, uh, is treated as a very different type of instrument than how it's discussed in, in current times in, let's say, our global debt crisis. And so thinking about money across these long spectrums is one of the hopes for this week's module. Um, and something that, you know, we can get into maybe in the Q&A portion or maybe uh, as the conversation naturally unfolds. Um, but what I want to do now is pass it to Sid. Sid, if you could give us just a few minutes on um, what you've seen with this article by Biology, uh, we can use that to kind of get into the specifics. Sure, let's get started. I'll just share my screen. And this will be not very much like Balaji's, a lot of ideas per minute version of this, but my version of like calmly recollecting the different lessons of history and all the different wonderful lessons that um, I've gathered uh, through reading Ray Dalio's work, Balaji's work, and other people's work. The specific article that uh, is very well timed. Like this came out on July 25th, uh, which represents the true state of the global financial system in 10 charts is what I want to cover. To set the context for that, I'll just very quickly recap um, what Vivek just said. Like firstly, um, like the idea of asking better questions 
uh, always comes from a place of humility and a place of wanting to understand what has already happened. So there have been people who have gone down this path. So one of my best resources from where I learned this was this book called The Lessons of History by Will Durant. And because both these authors, um, like husband and wife, uh, were alive in the late 1800s and they lived well into the 1900s they could capture patterns in different civilizations across time and fortunately we have this book as well as a video recording of both of them before they passed away so ray dalio was also very inspired by this particular book so this is one of the places where i would um, like to begin as a lesson that uh, as we are trying to ask better questions we can also see whether those questions have been asked before already and we can see a lot of this in Ray Dalio's work. So as we start reading Balaji's article, we see that the second word itself in the second paragraph is Ray Dalio. And like what he points towards in this article is that we should learn from history and that we are headed for something far worse than 2008. So like as like ask as we ask better questions of course we should take everything that we read uh, with a pinch of salt but we should go through all the facts that are presented here so um i want to take a moment and first try to understand through this figma board like what ray dalio has been saying so specifically Ray Dalio has been famous for this recent book principles for dealing with the changing world order where he goes into the big cycles behind empires rise and declines so traditionally these empires have been like um single states um but more broadly the definition of an empire is also changing but his broader thesis is that humanity goes through different sorts of cycles in the financial world these are short-term debt cycles and long-term debt cycles but in broader society we go through these cycles across technology culture economics and all these things so he drew out patterns for many many different countries across all these fields so education innovation and technology competitiveness output and trade military and so on so he his thesis is that education is always the leading indicator of strength of any particular group uh, or an empire. Once people have better education, what immediately follows after that is innovation and technology. What immediately follows when there is better innovation and technology is better military. Well, what follows, um, um, sorry, what follows after innovation and technology is competitiveness as everyone starts competing in the ideas marketplace and the marketplace of technology. And that's soon followed by military, trade, and all the other aspects of human society and finance, such as a financial center. And when the financial center um, aspect is at its peak, that's when we get into the uh, zone of making sure that that currency could be a reserve status. So the whole article that Balaji has written is questioning the reserve status of one particular currency, that is the US dollar. But uh, what Ray Dalio has um, studied is that this has happened many times in the past, and this has happened to many, many different cultures. If you want um, like a overview, I think Vivek uh, has linked these in the Figma, but there's a 43 minute version of what Ray Dalio has said, and there's a five minute version as well. So he goes into all these things in a lot of detail. So, so what I just said is very well illustrated there. So if anyone of you want to go through all these things, I would highly recommend to watch this video um, later. So that being said, um, like we all know that the US dollar has been um, like, holding that reserve status for a long time and like as uh, as people who have been students of crypto and web3 we have seen uh, most of us have started asking that question of what is money and i think that's what brought a lot of us into the space um, like we started que questioning the nature of money what it even means how has it historically evolved so all of us have gone down those rabbit holes of what the gold standard was about why was it uh, like a big thing back in the day and why the Bretton Woods agreement came in and how the US dollar um, became uh, the reserve currency. So 
uh, with all that background, we go into Balaji's article where he says that the current state of the global financial system is that there are more emergency loans uh, made in 2023 than during the financial crisis and that the banking system is on life support uh, because a lot of bonds, like billions of dollars of bonds are being sold to financial institutions and uh, there have been surprise rate hikes which are causing causing this entire scenario. And this is illustrated in the graph in which you see these sharp spikes uh, in the 2023 region. Uh, and uh, this goes on to show the next point, which is there has been more borrowing overall than the COVID period. So if, even if we consider COVID to be borrowing at a 0% rate, Today, the U.S. government is borrowing the same uh, historical sums of money in peacetime conditions at 5% rates. So the analogy that he draws is, this is the act of a desperate man maxing out his credit cards to pay his bills. So the broader thesis is not to uh, focus on one particular currency here. A lot of uh, countries and a lot of systems are going through something similar. And the point of this fireside chat is to question alternatives or question improvements to these systems, to look at alternatives for local financial systems as we look at global financial systems as well. So to uh, take an example of a local financial system, like Andy from Colonel came up with this particular one, which is called Honor, which has very simple characteristics in which all Honor currency is the same. Honor is only created when I accept someone else's proposal which is a very weird uh, feature for money to have, uh, which we don't find in traditional forms of money. I can forgive as much honor as I currently hold, and honor is non-transferable. So this is a very sharp um, opposite to the kinds of currencies we have known. And like we can discuss this in the rest of the fireside as to how should we think about money. Um, so coming back to Balaji's article, um, there has been more spending um, on uh, more spending uh, on US interest payments on federal debt, which is going to overtake the defense spending, which was the biggest budget line item for many, many years. And we see this sharp uh, spike, which demonstrates this, so which all these things. Yeah, like, go ahead. Yes, two minutes, Mark. Yeah. So to go into the rest of the points, all of these things are resulting in devaluation of the US dollar, like inflation is one consequence of it. And people um, are like, it's reported that US dollar has lost 25% of its value. And this has also accelerated more treasury being like dumped by different countries. And this helps other countries set the price of the US dollar as they get more equity in a country. Um, loosely speaking. There has been more gold buying by a lot of different nations, and this is affecting dollar status as a store of value. Then we see that there's more de-dollarization than ever. More and more countries are also looking at different ways of settling their trade, and um, this article goes into um, that. So you can go to the links to feature that. Then we, we have seen the sanctions as a very effective tool in the last many decades to be used against countries when they are not following the petrodollar system. But now we are seeing that the sanctions are also not uh, as strong of a weapon. So as we go forward in human society, we need to see how the effectiveness of a money is treated. And uh, the final two points is that the peacetime debt is approaching World War II levels, uh, like you, as you see in this graph. And the true debt uh, uh, is currently more than any other empire in history. So all of these uh, come to the point that uh, the current debt figure is $175 trillion. And when I was speaking to my friend Yeeson about it, he said, if you do it next week, it might be hit 176. So that's the rate at which we are um, going ahead. And uh, all the assets of the US uh, as a country combined are equal to almost all its liabilities and uh, debt at this point. So the bottom line that of the article is that the dollar in particular is needed less just when the US needs to borrow yeah. it more. So that is where we can stop here. And uh, if we get Balaji next week, we can go deeper into this article. Yeah. So that's where I'd like to pause.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really good thing to to know more about and a good place to start for today. The first question that comes to my mind when I read all this is like, okay, number one, to Sid's point, are there more localized approaches that we can take to counter the thought that this is just a global system that we have to kind of submit to? Like, what are the more local choices that we can make? And luckily, we're in a case where we have some answers to that question on the local side of like, well, we 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 are working in the crypto space, and and there's there's a few ways you can answer that question. Um, so we have a low kick here uh, from Circle, uh, who was also in a uh, previous kernel block. We're really grateful to have him back, as well as Benga, who is working on a stablecoin project focused on emerging markets. Um, and so between the two of them, maybe we'll start with Benga first, but if we could weave back and forth between you two, maybe a combined five minutes so we can get to Maggie uh, after the stablecoin component. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Vivek. And um... Yeah, I'll try to, you know, make this uh, brief just so that we can get some of the viewpoints from um, from Circle. I think it'd be very helpful as we start to think of um, alternatives to the current financial system and what part crypto has to play in all of this. Um, so I'll talk about stable coins. I'll give a quick overview um, before I kind of dive into what the current state of stable coin is today. Um, you know, as the name suggests, um, you know, Stable coins are cryptocurrencies with values pegged to um, an external reference, um, like the U.S. dollar, uh, typically fall in three buckets, um, fiat-backed, uh, crypto-backed, um, and um, algo-backed um, stable coins. Um, they maintain their price stability largely um, by pegging um, to a dollar and, of course, maintaining reserves against um, that peg. Um, so an example of a reserve would be uh, U.S. government um, treasuries. Um, and so as folks start to think of an alternative to uh, the global financial system today and where the uh, where we are seeing inefficiencies, um, stablecoin has been one of those, um, uh, you know, technologies um, that has sort of come into play. Um, we've seen remarkable growth of stablecoins over the last five years um, um, with strong adoption in emerging markets, traditional finance systems, um, and Web3 um, ecosystem, all really just addressing um, areas um, of, of inefficiencies around um, perhaps, you know, store of value, um, currency volatility, um, the speed of money, the fungibility of money, and the availability of money. Um, so I'll, I'll just run through some fascinating numbers here. Um, you know, today, um, the total market cap of all stable coins stands at over $155 billion. Um, two dominant players there, um, Tether and Circle. Um, we'll hear more, but, um, you know, um, Tether today commands about 74% of the market um, and, and Circle at 21%. Um, and today we're seeing over 100 million people um, you know, um, a holding stable coins that's up from 15% last year. Um, these are pretty um, astounding numbers. And so uh, the trajectory definitely is one where you're continuing to see folks harness the power of um, stable coins um, to address, you know, a lot of um, financial um, gaps and, you know, the rising prominence, uh, which, which sort of helps with the rising pop prominence of decentralized finance and away from more traditional finance systems. Um, I'll, um, I'll stop here and see if um, my, my buddy, my, my tag team buddy on this wants to come in before I continue on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I can quickly kind of chime in. Um, maybe a little bit, like, I just wanted to show, like, the impact of this. Maybe I can just quickly share my screen. Uh, that might be the easiest, because, uh, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So, like, if you look at, like, the adoption of in general stables, right, you look at how, like, from 2018, we've kind of gone to today stables being the dominant way of how people exchange value on uh, open blockchain networks. And I think that's super interesting in terms of how dominant this has been as a medium of exchange. Uh, when you look at money, right, um, 
uh, few kind of properties is it's 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 a unit of exchange, it's a store of value, and it's a medium of exchange. And just from a medium of exchange perspective, um, we're increasingly seeing more use cases which uh, uh, which where there is a store of value uh, or, or or there's a unit of exchange, people can easily exchange them here. And if you compare this to like parts with like the Web two world, right, like like the amount of money that is flowing or settling, uh, stable coins have gone like, like exponentially, uh, almost matching Visa scale today. Um, so they're kind of seeing the benefits of like open blockchain systems, smart contracts, and coupled with like how you can make money more programmable, money as we know it today, uh, make kind of more programmable. I think in terms of like, often I get asked like, what are people doing with this? Uh, like what are, what are essentially the use cases? And the way I see that is like a lot of like use case today is a mixture of like level one and level two where we are. Level one is like basically digital asset trading in DeFi, wherein people are using a lot of the stables as a medium of exchange to get into like DeFi on yield trade and do things. We're also increasingly seeing like in hyperinflation countries, there's like a store of value or like a remittance kind of use case. When you look at stable coins powered by public blockchain networks, it's the easiest way to kind of send money between two people, like money for the internet. Yep. There are more use cases around consumer payments, corporate payments, and tokenizations, but all of them have like they're yet to kind of pick pick up due to either a UX problem, a legal regulation problem, um, or just in general, like I think block space has been very expensive till now. It's getting a lot cheaper uh, this year. Uh, but historically has been a bit more expensive. So yeah, so just like a quick overview on where we are at the journey uh, in, in the stablecoin adoption. It's still super, super early. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, it's cool to see that it's early, but like these numbers and these charts, they're, they're overlapping with some pretty serious um, players from the, the traditional space. And you see Fedwire at the top there. You see the tie to U.S. Treasuries. We'll maybe come back to some of the questions in the chat uh, in a minute here. But the questions are really pertinent on like, where do stable coins continue to go from here? What is the next part of the game? Especially if there's this broader concern about, let's say, something like the U.S. dollar. And where, where do you stable coins and other currencies fit into that mix. But it's really helpful to hear. Anything else from Benga Alokik that you guys think? Um, I was gonna just um, close out with um, sharing like, you know, the how powerful the adoption of, um, you know, stable coins have gone. And I think some point last year, I wanna say maybe August of last year, um, the total transaction volume um, reached almost seven trillion um, uh, of, of stable coins across across different networks, and that easily overtook, um, you know, Mastercard and PayPal. I think um, PayPal comes in at almost two trillion, so um, that's three x of that, and just show you how powerful. Um, stable coins as an, an alternative uh, financial um, system to close inefficiencies and in, in, in how we use um, or how we view money today um, is becoming. And so sort of a nice um, transition into um, how we, you know, answer what those questions around what this all means, um, you know, regulation, the politics, obviously stable coins has become political too, Um and how it, the technology itself um, evolves. So just uh, wanted to highlight that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think what I wanted to highlight with all that is like, we are very much in a moment in time. Um, there is a, uh, a feeling that the current financial system is struggling. Uh, the current world order is changing. And if there is an alternative movement that is in discussion, in dialogue with uh, the current systems, uh, it is the one that we're kind of sitting in right now. And I I really feel strongly that that Maggie and the work that's been going on in Shifa's world is at the forefront of like the movement or the type of financial system that that I'm most excited about. Um, it represents a vision for crypto, I think, that is much more interesting. 
and uh, has just been kind of like a source of a lot of excitement for, I think, all of us. And so I really want to just introduce Maggie well. We've gotten to know each other over the years. We both worked at Consensus in the earlier days. And to see how Shifi has evolved uh, over the last four plus years has been has been really exciting. And so first and foremost, just a warm welcome to Maggie. Thank you for being with us in Kernel. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And if anything did stand out from like the earlier part here, uh, happy to hear your take on it, your take on what DeFi is and, and what it might become. Um, and yeah, maybe just start from there. Um, and of course, we'll, we'll get to talk about Shifi along the way. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Vivek. Uh, great presentation by the two former uh, groups presenting. Um, and yeah, I think it's I, I struggle with Balaji sometimes, I'm going to be honest. Um, like, I do think that if you join the space early, like I did in 2016 or 2017, it was very Bitcoin influenced, like the, still the Ethereum values were Bitcoin influenced. So definitely understanding that Bitcoin was a hedge against the world order collapsing was like something you went into the space with eyes wide open. Um, I think as we get into NFTs and consumer crypto and we talk about Web 2.5, which I'm not the biggest, the 2.5, I'm not the biggest advocate of uh, because of risk. Um, I think that we might forget that that's a part of this potential bet. Um, whether or not we agree with it or we want it to happen because like most people just want to like go to Costco and have a sub, you know, a nice life or something. I do uh, think that, you know, there is Balaji's kind of continuing to bear that torch of like uh, being the alarm around the financial world system falling apart. Um, and I did uh, see, you know, a tweet or whatever. I didn't a deep dive that like some journalists actually view this network state concept as something more like mini dictatorships by all these <laughs> technological people with massive amounts of wealth. So I think two things is like, yes, there are numbers pointing towards the United States having this debt crisis. A lot of uh, the world powers have, we all have tangled debt. Um, two, it's like true, but I like to believe that we're smart enough to figure out a way to navigate all this. I want to have a little more high faith trust in all of us. Like we all have a part in who we elect and what we do and how we uh, contribute to those policies. Um, and three, I think we need to be always looking for the other sides and viewpoints of people outside of our industry who might be looking at who's going to govern these network states. Like we all know with the centralized autonomous organizations, like how many of them are doing super well? I'm not here to be negative, but I do think like Yes, Balaji was right about COVID and he is a great big thinker, um, sense maker, all that, all that. But I also think we need to be careful even in this space who we let influence our consciousness. And we have to be asking harder questions about the types of systems they want to see in the world. And are they actually, uh, this person was saying it's, they're not actually pro-democracy. Now, these are all people's opinions. It's important to read all these things and take in all this information. Um, but anyways, that's kind of like some things I've been thinking about in terms of like these people with really large followings and names. Um, and yeah, I believe we can do better. Uh, and I hope that we don't need the collapse of a financial system in order for the crypto financial system to work. Um, no, we do need Web 2.5. I'm sorry. I don't mean like stable coins are not a thing, but I it is a point of centralization. And that's just something you have to take into consideration uh, with anything you're acting. I hold USDC, so maybe I misspoke there as well. Um, but I think like what I try to teach in Shifi is no matter what decision you're making, I don't advocate necessarily for like one or the other, but you understand the risks of holding your tokens at a centralized exchange versus holding in your hot wallet versus holding it in your crypto wallet. And we saw the Silicon Valley bank crisis happen in January, 2023. So like, we have to be aware of like every single activity and asset and thing we hold in this space and how we hold it comes with a different set of risk parameters. Um, and you get to choose like, how much do I want to trust the institution and how much do I want to trust myself? Each of those having different risk parameters. Um, but a bit about that. Um, and yeah, and I'm curious to see how like stable coins 
you know, they're saying that the U.S. dollar is less prominent, right, with these uh, new countries going off the U.S. dollar or not being in the trading groups. I'm not, I can't remember what it's called. But then stable coins being adopted obviously helps uh, solidifies the U.S. dollar in new ways that are outside of these like governmental agreements of how they're going to settle uh, things financially. Um, so yeah, I guess those are some thoughts. I hope not too spicy to start it off. Um, and I haven't read the Balaji thing in depth. So like, I'm not an expert either on any of this stuff as well. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about like where I think, you know, the future is going. And I think we're all aware that in 2024, like Bitcoin's not going away. Ethereum's not going away. Um, and these are probably the two most prominent financial open system rails where like the accounts and the transactions are happening outside of the bank, right? So even the account part is happening outside of the bank now. And um, why I think it's uh, really inspiring to me and why I thought it was so important to start a whole educational program around DeFi uh, in 2019 is that um, for some history in, in the 1970s, married women still needed in the United States, in the United States, women still needed a male co-signer to uh, like on their bank account, right? And I think why I get excited about DeFi and these open financial systems is that for the first time ever, uh, a woman or someone who's been left out of that financial system for whatever reason uh, can now have a bank account that they are in total control over. And like that is probably the biggest evolution uh, in banking for individuals everywhere who are left out of these systems. Um, that we've seen. And so like my, like one goal with Shifa, I have many, but I say if the only thing you do is download this wallet um, and have five, even five, you know, US dollars in there, uh, you have five US dollars that are totally yours. Um, and I think that's like really important that we build these financial systems that enable many, many different type of people to transact um, and uh, engage in commerce and you know, have access to uh, tools they wouldn't necessarily have. For a bit of perspective, Shifa is in 90 countries. And this uh, latest cohort, which had over 1,300 women and non-binary folks in it, the largest group of people came from India. The second largest group came from the United States. And the third largest group came from Nigeria. So isn't that incredible? <laughs> like, I, like, just the fact that, like, all these women are engaging on the same ledger, on the same open financial system, using the same tools. And for once, it doesn't matter where I live or where anybody else lives, but all of these women have access to the same uh, tooling. Now, do they have access to the same financing yet to maybe do all of the activities we like them to do? No, we're still working on that. But I think it's incredible to think about we're all sharing this same financial system and uh, we can all get loans from the same financial system. We can all engage in staking and earn interest. Uh, we can all uh, engage in liquidity providing and trading on this system. So for me, it makes a lot of sense that uh, this alternative financial system has a lot of utility for potentially more people than the current ones have that are geography based. Um, but, you know, do I think that DeFi is necessarily going to replace the the U.S. financial hegemony in my lifetime, uh, like probably not. And do I, am I ready for what that world looks like? No, but I do think that there will be, as Vivek was saying earlier, kind of like these localized, like I do think DAOs will have success in kind of like localized community building and maybe local economies and local currencies. Um, but I think that will take a long time. And I think we get a little bit impatient in crypto. And I think we have to remember that especially if any part that's rewiring how humans make decisions um, and how we actually can come together for that very beautiful utopia of all of our interests align and none of us are going to, you know, deplete the treasury or the natural asset um, out of selfishness um, is like going to take, I think, decades. And I don't think we should be upset by some of these things taking decades um, I think we should think about like, how can I contribute to that system today while I still can contribute instead of watch it get ossified, uh, you know, in a way that might not be as beneficial to this like community or system that we're really trying to build. Um, I, I don't know. I'll just open it up for questions now. I, 
I'm not sure if that was like super helpful, but I think that, you know, my biggest goal is that every woman has, every woman has financial uh, sovereignty. Um, and that leads to also bodily autonomy. And that leads to uh, new opportunities and being able to, um, like, we still know that if you give women money, it like, it, it helps any economy. Like if, if we like, give women uh, financial access and opportunities, like it will solve a lot of the economy's problems. The last thing I want to say about what I do too is there's going to be a wealth transfer in the next, like, I think, um, couple decades. And just in the United States, women are going to inherit $30 trillion. So as we're thinking about these new financial systems and applications and, you know, what you're learning about, uh, we've long ignored women in crypto. Like, you all go to events. And so as you're thinking about who you're building for, um, it's the mass onboarding is not going to be the person online 24 hours a day, seven days a week being a DGEN. Like, yes, that's very helpful for liquidity and TVL and uh, transaction volume right now, but you don't want to miss out on just in the United States, uh, $30 trillion, right? So I think that's something I think about often as well. Like, how do we unlock all that capital? Uh, to help this new financial system and allow them not only to bring their capital to this place, but be a part of building it. Amazing. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I kind of just rambled, but was, I just went with the flow. It was wonderful. No, thank you so much. And I feel, I feel like a freshness from the approach, the, the thing that I feel is this idea of like evolution, not revolution, which is, um, which is also related to a lot of the, just kind of like approaches that you're taking. I mean, 1300 people and doing it at a, like a clip of, is it three seasons per, um, per year right now, Maggie? Yes. <laughs> Eight weeks. And I think about 11 to 12, maybe 13 topics. I can't remember what I do each week, but we start with infrastructure. So that's like blockchain wallet scaling. Then we go into a DeFi overview, which touches into the 101 use cases and then 102 as well, like what are options. Uh, then we go into stable coins, staking, swapping, uh, NFTs, Web3 social, DAOs and governance. So, uh, and yeah. those come in and come out and change over time. Like NFTs used to be two classes, but now they're more of like a primitive than they are, I think like the main show or you know, DAOs used to be the hottest topic. And now I think that's also like can be condensed down to one class. And for some perspective, each class is an hour and a half. And I spend about three to four hours a week uh, with the people in the cohort. So um, it's a lot of, it's sort of like this, like it's, it's an intensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's good to just have the context of like the slow and steady evolution and growth while also how quickly it's happening along along the same lines and and both of those things being a part of the movement that we are a part of in crypto um while it may feel like there are parts of it that are not happening fast enough um that along with what maggie is sharing i think some of the the charts from a look stand out and and they temper I think some of the charts that Balaji is sharing and maybe the existing traditional financial system isn't as bad as it's being brought out to be. But if there was a place to make an impact, um, I think there is a really good case to be made for educating and engaging in the financial system that we're engaging in, starting with wallets, starting with trying things on chain um, with watching the innovation in the stablecoin space, watching the innovation in new styles and types of tokens and seeing how that adds to the mix uh, and the evolution of of what finance is, uh, is, is a reasonable place to be. And that's the one where we sit in. So thank you so much, Maggie. I think there's lots of comments in the chat that also retweet it. Um, yeah. I also think Vivek, you touched on something like, I don't, yeah, I don't think the current financial system is, perfect. Like banks have facilitated dark things happening. I won't necessarily bring them up, but like JP Morgan facilitated a pretty dark actor in the world of humanity uh, to have money to do dark things to people. Um, and so I, I don't think it's like perfect. And I do think there's like a lot of flaws, but I also think like something I recognize in the crypto space, like when I went to the consensus retreat in 2018, 
Um, everyone was so bright eyed and bushy tailed. I was like, do you think about how what you're building can be used for evil? And um, they were all like, no, <laughs> you know, like, I think like, especially on this call too, probably, but I also think we shouldn't be naive to think that as we're helping the least of the people get onboarded into the new financial system, we are allowing, uh, I don't want to like, I, I'm not trying to say like, this is for true, but like, we do know money laundering and all that can happen as well. Um, or like with privacy protocols. Right. So I think that's also something to think about while you're going through this course is like, it is that there's always that tension when you're usually helping the least of people, you're also enabling sort of like the worst of, of people with some of these technologies. And what does like that financial system look like? And how does that, what does that financial system fund? And what is that financial system uh, like, you know, enable? Yeah. Yeah. There's a bit of that in the general channel right now with um, what's going on with, uh, with a lot of the telegram bots that are associated with, uh, all of the blocks that are being mined on uh, on Ethereum these days. So lots of lots of things happening on chain as well that we should not be uh, closed minded to. And so yeah, perhaps more balanced is what I sense from from having you here, Maggie. So thank you for that. Um, I know you only have a few more minutes. Does anyone have questions for Maggie? Feel free to unmute and we can go through them. I can try to get through some in the chat, but. Um, would appreciate if anyone would be willing to unmute. Nelly, would love to start with you. Uh, hi, Maggie. Uh, you mentioned the yen. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, who is the non degen client and who do you think we should focus on? Yeah. So, um, I think like anyone, you know, who wants to use like a lending protocol, isn't necessarily like a DGEN. Um, I think like we're seeing experiments with like Winnie and her chipped nails, like, uh, providing like web three type experiences and ways of connecting social graphs that aren't, uh, someone who's like sitting on their computer 24 hours a day. Um, and I think as we, what we hope of this, like, world computer, this layer that any uh, type of application can be built on top of, that we're going to actually remove, move away from these like hyper financialized types of applications uh, and like look at basically every platform we use today being a, this kind of marketplace that more directly can connects the users and the, uh, the other, the providers in that market, let's say. Um, but yeah, I think like if you want every woman to be on chain, probably uh, like these interesting restaking yield farming scheme type things might not be like the best way to invite them into the space. Thank you. Um, Jackie, you had a question. Would you like to unmute and ask? Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me though. Yeah, We can yeah. hear you. Yeah, I'm, a bit, I'm gonna be a bit controversial. But... So, we know that the current system is financial, it's financing the current, the ongoing genocides all over the world now. Like, how do we avoid, how do you think we can avoid that for the financial system that we are trying to be with three? Because the yeah, values, like, I got, as, I, as I see, it's like, I don't know. The whole point of Web3 is it's censorship resistant. And so you're like, we're getting to like a post-policing world almost in terms of like what people can do. Um, and I think that's like the big question we have to grapple with. Um, and I think that it might like if people want to finance these things, they're going to figure out how to do it because what we're dealing with is all these different power hungry groups and individuals. And I don't know right now, I'm just pretty sold on the idea that power corrupts because um, I'm not seeing a lot of it used in a positive way all over the world right now. Um, but yeah, I think like, there is no stopping anyone from funding anything on the blockchain. Hmm. Now, maybe we know what's happening. Yeah, maybe that, it does actually cool. happen on Ethereum and it's a public ledger and we can trace it. But, and, and so like, you know, we live in the era of Twitter. So now we understand which countries are funding what sides of every conflict in many places right now. Um, but I think that, maybe that's what we just see more. It becomes more and more transparent. Uh, 
of like what is going on, but if there's privacy on top of it, we have no way of seeing. But I guess that's 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 that's, that's my question. Like we are like privacy. It's, we cannot now have it in public. We have knowledge, and I think we know a lot of things. And blockchain is helping to know like to have a trace. But traceability and being open doesn't avoid to the things that are happening in the world now. Like the idea of having a technology that can change things is actually it can change things. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Maggie. Go ahead. No, I think the last thing I, I, I want to say is like, yeah, we can't stop Help it. But I think if we can uplift a ton of people also by the same technology, will some of these things be will the, 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 the rules of the game change if just more people are have financial empowerment? I don't know. But you can take the bet like if more people have financial empowerment uh, in certain regions, like will they not be as easily being able to be taken over by these people that rise to power and you know seek to harm? I don't know, um, but that could be a potential outcome. Vivek? Yeah, I, I wanted to poke in with one last question because I know Maggie has to go from Sudan, if soon you're willing, the, the focus on perhaps the more local and the more grassroots of the efforts. I think that, has another angle to what's going on in crypto and san would you be willing to share what your question or your, your thought was in the chat it's the last one hey vivek are you asking me san yeah 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 okay cool um question what was my question i can't remember <laughs> i think i was Hi. asking about um, stable coins being based on being issued from a regenerative. Oh, okay. Now I remember. This is about um, when stable coins are backed by US dollars, um, and those US dollars are basically taken out of circulation. So, what effect does that have on the economy? Does it does it mean that US dollars are, are in less supply? And does it the second order consequence being that? Um, the Fed issues more money into the system, more debt-based money into the system. Maybe that is a question for Alokic. I don't know if we still have him on the call, though. I'm not sure that's my understanding of, of how stablecoin issuance works, but the questions that I, I was actually pointing at, if, if there was a place to go there, was... Was on was on the local uh, the local project that you were exploring this like local backed stablecoin. Okay, okay. So I went off on a segue there. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I, I was. I'm really curious about a stablecoin issued from a regenerative economic system, one where the stablecoin is backed by something that's alive and that planetary benefit. So if I'm stewarding a piece of land in South Africa, for example, and I'm stewarding that land with the, um, in a regenerative way, like planting a tree here or planting a, a very, um, a, a, like lots of companion plants around the tree, my regenerative activities here is of net planetary benefit. So I'm curious about if we could issue a stable coin based on that square meter of land using the current re, uh, real world assets that we have and using NFTs. How would that change the game? Yeah, and Maggie, I, I don't mean to push you, I was about to answer that one, but I just wanted to illustrate the, the possibility. Yeah, I don't have an answer. I wouldn't say this is my area of expertise, like how that impacts the rest of the US dollar system. Mm -hmm. Fair enough, yeah. I think the, San, why, why I was excited to bring it into the conversation is just like the, the hope that there are some of these weirder forms of money that we might uh, continue to experiment with and that might represent different styles of uh, currency as, as time goes on. Um, I want to be respectful, Maggie, of your time. I want to say thank you to you. You, you do have to go, I think, now. but Yeah, um, unfortunately, we have two Shifai summits coming up this year in uh, Singapore and Bangkok. Uh, 
another cohort in the fall. So we got lots going on to steer the ship, but I appreciate the time. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, feel free to reach out or there's a lot of Shifi members in here um, and Shifi allies. So I'm sure they know just about as much as they have as many opinions as I do. I hope this was informative and or helpful. This was a bit out of my comfort zone, but I still wanted to to do it. So I teach much more like the mechanics of how things work, but I was uh, super happy to be invited here. Thanks so much, Maggie. Take care. Good luck with both the summits and everything else you got. Thank you so much. Goodbye. We grateful to have Maggie, grateful Benga to have you and said to kick us off. Um, yeah, it might be a bit of a moment to reset. We still have a bit of time here, at least 10, 15 or so, if we want to continue the dialogue. Um, perhaps my instinct is to check with Benga really quick to see like how it all has felt for you, given you helped kick us off today. Yeah, actually, I was going to jump in there and just share some thoughts on um, Sand's question. Um, you know, generally what drives um, stablecoin issuance is, you know, what problem it's trying to solve. So if you can clearly demonstrate, um, you know, the product in the market fit for what the stablecoin is trying to solve, then, you know, whether it's a community or the folks that want to, you know, rally around it um, will, will sort of organically happen. Um, obviously, you know, you, you still have to put, you know, your 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 case and your value prop out there. Um, but all, all that to say, like, you know, you'd probably, you know, attract folks who really care about um, the planet and, um, you know, um, how, how we're taking care of it and, and that sort of a thing. And so that would help drive, you know, the value and the ultimate adoption of the stable coin. Um, my sense is that's not um, compared to the other folks who are using it for all tra traditional finance use cases. That's probably a smaller group of folks. Um, when you start to unpack maybe the ESG group um, um, and um, social impact group, maybe it take, tends to, you know, take on more adoption. Uh, but I wouldn't see it like being a game changer uh, early days, but could potentially be something uh, pretty strong um, as there's more um, there's more awareness about how that is helping the planet, whether from a, a climate change perspective or, you know, because there is a lot of themes around regenerative finance, but I think it's pretty awesome. I think it's cool. I would be, a, you know, a, a cheerleader and an ally for that sort of effort. Um, but um, yeah, it, it would be a bit of a, a, a slow grind. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really appreciated perspective and awesome to see maybe you two continue at least having dialogue about it. Um Rohan, happy to hear from you. Yeah, thanks, Vivek. I have a quick question for Benga about stablecoin, right? Uh, earlier in the discussion, we kind of like hinted that, you know, things like Circle are kind of um, like Web 2.5 in a way that, you know, Circle, the company, is kind of responsible for doing this. This obviously costs them something. They're probably making money in some way doing this. And so there's sort of in that one USD equals one USDC, there's a whole lot of like other kind of implicit costs kind of caught in there as well as, you know, maybe some dependencies and so on. Um, you know, Vic, you know, I did read that article about uh, evolution, not revolution. And I think the main point was like systems are very complex. And if you just cut off the head and replace it with a new head, you have a you know different king same system kind of thing um ben, i'm curious on your thoughts about you know one sort of the i guess centralized issuance of stable coins or maybe a better way to ask this is like you know in the stable coin world uh where do you stand on sort of these like algorithmic stable coins some of which are like you know uh crash and burn fantastically others which kind of stick around uh 
And two, Vivek, for you, and I guess Benga as well more generally, like, is the case here for these decentralized systems as an alternative for the banking, uh, the large global kind of banking system, one that is trying to encourage like more localized systems, right? From person to person or person to community, as opposed to something that's much more global and hard to sort of completely overhaul. Yeah, thanks, Rohan. Um, appreciate the question and, and your your thinking there. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's an ongoing debate, right? Um, technologies evolve. There are different iterations of it. Um, you, if you think about what the different buckets of um, where stablecoins fall, it's fiat, it's it's crypto backed, it's um, algo backed. Um, we all saw, unfortunately, what happened in um, um, 2022, I guess it was, with Luna um, and sort of like a blow up of the algo back. Um, the way I think of it, I think, you know, and this, that's where a lot of the conversation around the technology being Web 2.5 is, is it's really still leveraging the existing system. And so there is a lot of trust um, with the U.S. dollar, and that's usually what that's really what the the the, the stable coins pegged to the dollar are riding on. They're riding on that trust, that full faith and credibility of the United States government, um, in 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 sort of like historically being a strong, um, again, arguable, <laughs> arguable. Um, a strong store of value. And so it, it's it's sort of leveraging that trust to build a system or a technology that can address some of the um some of the areas where you see inefficiencies in the cash fiat USD today, whether that, you know, whether it's the velocity, the 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 liquidity or um the the inclusion from a um, um, availability perspective or the speed of money, like um, you know, you could check all those boxes as areas where um, stablecoin has come in to to be more efficient. So uh, I, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, yeah, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head. Velocity, inclusion, and what was the third one? Benga. Um, velocity inclusion. Um, I'm sorry, I losing it myself. <laughs> Um, and maybe store value. Store value, okay. And and I think what I would just note note here is this is stablecoin product market fit, right? Like stablecoins are are hitting it, they're making it, and they're one of the use cases of crypto. Weirder forms of money and money as intertwining with speech, I think, is like another another way to think about it, Rohan. Like the 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 point that San is making, the ideas of like these like different styles of money. I, I just, I want Kernel to be a place for sure where we encourage that type of experimentation because money need not be this like hyper global thing that affects everybody. It can be something that's attempted, poked at. And if we return to like what it originally was, we have a chance to start like a lot more of these localized experiments. And Rohan, your work on memetics is like really like instructive here, I think, in that like these localized weird money experiments, there's no reason why memetics can't drive them into other worlds. But starting where we are is to say that like we should play around with different things. And that's the hope with something like Honor is that we might play around with it in kernel and it's still pretty buggy and we're having issues with it, even within a group of like 100 to 200 people in a kernel block. But if we can play with it well here, that's interesting as a start. And um, it may not be as small of a start as we think, but it's it's the place we, we're, we're hopeful to see a lot of those types of experiments. Sid also brought up the Oak experiment in Oakland, which is an Oakland-based community currency. All these need not end up small, but like memetics, money as speech, starting small are, are senses that that I'd like to like really like kind of like maybe have like a list of these types of experiments that are happening concurrently 
that are different from the stablecoin point that Bingo is making, which is like at a global scale, stable coins have product market fit. They're already making an impact. And that's a different, that's a kind of a completely different game. Um, maybe Drew. Yeah, I can jump in quick. I just want to um, reflect on something that Benga said earlier around like people, like different kind of like groups within Web3 and attributing different value to stable coins and like, you know, how that's something that's kind of growing, but maybe isn't like a huge influence yet. And something that really, you know, comes to mind for me is Flow Dollar. And I'm sure there's folks in the audience that are familiar with them. It's like a really interesting kind of experiment around stable coins that really, to me, kind of changes the game a bit because it gives people a chance to not only like go to a stable coin to speak or go with a certain currency because they have to, because it's the dominant currency and they have to use it, or being able to like choose the currency you go with based on values, right? As opposed to just having to go with it because it's the centrally traded one. So, you know, the flow dollar, a portion of, or sorry, they invest the, the funds that they get into, you know, treasury bonds, things like that, the US currency to back it. And then um, just like USDC does, and then they take the earnings from that and use it to fund public goods and, and, and charities and, and universal basic income. So it's really interesting. So instead of like, you know, investing in a centralized stable coin where the reserve, where the funds that they get from investing the, the, uh, the cash that they take in, it goes to something good instead of like a group of like 20 people and some corporation. It's a really like positive kind of thing and you can align your value to that. Um, so it's really cool how like stable coins and Web3 is creating a system where a currency isn't just something you have to go with because it's the dominant currency to one where you can kind of like choose one based on your values and the communities that you align with. And so I just don't bang if you had any thoughts that I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. No, I think it ties up perfectly to what San was, um, you know, uh, um, maybe he's ideating or, or building that, um, like just picking a stable coin that aligns to your values. And especially if they're values that are, um, you know, not so nuanced that it's just very little adoption. Um, I think, you know, there, there's definitely, um, it, and then you, 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 as you think of like the innovation in the space, it's definitely one of the areas where I think it's going to have adoption with time. Um, but then, of course, you still have to go back to the fundamental question, like, you know, what are the underlying, you know, reserves or or systems or mechanisms in place that are supporting that stability of the coin? Um, and how strong are the fundamentals? If I think those questions are answered, then you're going to see more of these, like, you know, flow dollar of stable coins out there in the market. Thank you. Go ahead, Sid. Yeah, like just um, the sense that I was getting after like seeing all the chats is that there is so much interest in the notion of uh, stability or how do we define stability. Um, so I just wanted to share like these articles from the kernel DeFi library, which goes into the details of the design of Maker, uh, like Dai, as well as um, Rai. So there's like a whole paragraph around like why be stable and like what what is the phenomena of stability like and how have different stable coins in the crypto um, ecosystem have thought about these things. So I'll drop a link to that in the chat. And I just wanted to, before handing over to Grace, leave you with this very funny and interesting comment that I found on Ray Dalio's video, like the two critical conclusions um, that uh, we got across um, learning from empires, is that education is the foundation of an empire's wealth, and it's constantly neglected. Like, for example, we see that as soon as education starts getting neglected, everything else starts getting neglected or goes into a downfall. And the second point was the bubble bursts that we observe are a result of wealth inequality. And these phenomena and questions like the ones that we're asking in such a session are very important to make sure we don't fall into that trap of inequality again and again as humans have uh, across different cycles that we have observed. So that's those are the comments I wanted to um, leave everyone with and handing over to Grace now. As you were speaking, I was thinking about what you were saying about education, and then I was thinking about this education that we're doing now, and this is a side comment to my question, and like how 
it's bad for the existing system for people to be educated this way, the way that you and Colonel are doing it. And so it might not be a coincidence, like it might be that as the system becomes corrupt, it makes sure that people get bad education because they shouldn't ask such questions. Like, I was thinking about that. Anyway, um, my question was about, so we're talking about currency and backing currency and we're backing currency with currency. And then there was this whole thing about gold and backed and, un and if you look at all the money in the world, it, there's more money than world. So if you thought of every money, like one of the things we learned was like money is a promise of something, right? A good or a service and whatever. So presumably it's not just like a monetary debt, which is a debt. Like we think of these monetary debts as we were learning about the financial system as debts vis-a-vis -vis some other entity that is a human entity. But actually if it's a promise of something on the planet and we have 10 times as much money as planet, it seems that mathematically eventually hyperinflation has to happen like devaluation of all the currency because eventually let's say we tried to use everything on the planet eventually you cut down all the rainforests and mine all the like we're getting close to that point where we can't make like squeeze any more juice out of the actual physical infrastructure that we have and so i'm wondering what people are thinking about the disproportionality of the actual planet backing all the promises that money is saying that we could have if we had all that money. Did, did my question make sense? Like, did you understand the question? Like, I'm kind of like, how can we, like, we can never make good on all these promises. Yeah, I think, I think it does. I think, I think um, debt, you know, it's maybe one thing, Grace, I, I just love that you've brought debt and and the shelling out uh articles into the forefront if if you haven't caught up on what's happened in the colonel general channel that's where you could if if you'd like and i think dalio and a lot of the work in in let's say the biology sphere it was like about the last 500 years and grace the work that you're referring to is at least five thousand years old if not older and so it comes from a very different frame on what money is and what debt is, which I'm really glad to have in the discussion. Um, and I can read perhaps the portion that, that Grace was alluding to, which is that, um, uh, number one, my favorite definition of community comes from Graeber. And a community is defined by Graeber as a place where everyone is a little indebted to one another. Everyone is a little bit indebted to one another. You can't really tell, but you kind of feel like, oh my God, that person did a lot for me or this person did a lot for me. And as a result, I can't really tell, but I just feel, I feel that feeling. I feel that feeling of indebtedness, which indebtedness in that regard has this positive connotation, which feels different than the way that we usually feel when we hear the word debt. And so these are the quotes. It says, that's community. Community means everybody owes everybody else something and everybody remembers what they owe and eventually they settle it and start over again. In this sense, that isn't a ter terrible thing, but there's still this shadow of sin that's floating over it. Where does that come from? More generally, a debt is a promise, to Grace's point, which you can phrase in exactly quantifiable terms because you can quantify it, it's impersonal and then transfer, therefore transferable. According to some theories, that is what money actually is, a transferable promise. One of the great questions is how this came about and why is there a need to quantify promises precisely? Um, so it's, it's a question, not an answer, but different ways. But that is referring to the promises between me and you right? Like that I'm indebted to you for this course, and maybe you're indebted to me for asking hard mm -hmm. questions and you know, like that. I'm referring to we're actually making promises on behalf of the planet. Like I'm going to make you an electric car. And that electric car is going to come from lithium and petroleum and, you know, these metals and those metals. And I'm, if I'm holding a bazillion dollars, which we are, and I print another cryptocurrency, which is worth another mm -hmm. bazillion dollars, I'm promising more, I'm just saying electric cars for the sake of argument. And there's no way to, I'm, I'm actually creating indebtedness 
that isn't from person to person, but is actually based on the planet. You're going to be able to buy a house. We're going to build more houses. We're going to build enough houses for all the people. Like that's not something I'm giving you. It's some, the cement comes from somewhere. Yeah. And the cement's not involved in our promises to each other. Yeah. It's interesting. Sister, love to hear from you, Millie as well. Hi, so um, I was, I've been thinking throughout this conversation about how we can bring this to the communities that we're serving and what that looks like. Um, something that came into mind is sort of crowdsourcing. So just having a dialogue where we can, you know, um, have these inquiries of, uh, but I think also too, there needs to be, um, there's so much complexity that would be really beneficial to kind of abstract out so that when we have conversations with everyday people um, that it's not, it doesn't sound foreign. Like I, it sounds foreign to me. <laughs> so I think, you know, I'm just trying to find a way to what I would love to have a dialogue about that. How can we take these questions um, and these challenges that are happening and see them as opportunities um, for everybody to be part of that shared dialogue. One thing that comes to mind um, in particular is um, when we're looking at different ways of how we might be looking at a cryptocurrency, um, you know, sort of, you know, money as intertwining with speech is an example. I think that um, you and a few other people maybe have brought up. And I, this is just one of many examples of how, how this can look, right? And so I think to give, to kind of put these things into layman's terms and to be able to explain it to the communities that we are a part of is so important because that is, I think, the reason why things are so skewed is because not everybody is being onboarded. You know, so few people get to be a part of the select conversation, but actually if we were to understand what communities we're serving and then present this as part of a shared dialogue, what would that look like? Yeah, I think it's, it's a fantastic point. And one that we should talk on sister to the extent you're willing, like whether it's, starting with like a little document that we all can imagine as like this is the the starting point for dialogue that that we we offer and um i know andy is keen on exploring honor in different contexts but there's other ways many many ways um and i'd be curious to see what starting point you might come to and that we totally can contribute towards um anyone who's interested in the slack um Millie, maybe, if that works, yeah. Um, thanks a lot. Um, sorry, I'm a bit sick. Um, I, I was just thinking about um, stable currencies and uh, we've been discussing um, about the success of, of many projects, right? And, and where we are on the path uh, to developing something that really works and that can be implemented, that actually solves certain problems. And then um, I was also thinking about um, what stability means for people from different backgrounds, right? Coming from countries with hyperinflation, um and how this um yeah this notion of stability is more valued or um i guess uh, more appreciated in these countries and um or talking about you know transparency <laughs> in in situations where uh corruption is taking place everywhere and what it means for people and um also yeah, just uh, just thinking about how important it is uh, to include all the different perspectives from people coming um, from from the from the areas of the world where um, these challenges are prevalent, right? 
um, in order to develop solutions that that address many of the problems that we were talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Love that. Thank you, Mary. We got a, only a few minutes left today. Um, Sid, any instincts now? I don't know if gather makes sense or if we should kind of let it marinate a little. Big week. Yeah, there lots. are there are lots and lots of comments in the chat, which we should continue on Slack. And yeah, people have posted a lot of links. So so yeah, I think the chat from the session is as rich as the conversations were. Yeah. I, I'd say, yeah, like maybe that's one of our goals. And sister, your your question and prompt is is a part of it, is like maybe we we try our best to like pull out some things out of the chat. We have the possibility that Balaji may join us next week, which means that the global financial system topic will continue into week three if if we are able to pull that off. But even if Balaji doesn't come for whatever reason, maybe we we try to like compile and and build out something new, uh, something fresh in terms of uh, whatever has happened here today as a start. Um, and anyone who wants to participate, we can uh, we can share a link to that in the weekly email and also directly in Slack. But um, Benga, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, huge thanks to, to Maggie and Alokic as well and, and Sid as well for trying to engage and everyone who's tried to help us find a little bit of a different part of this elephant, which is the global financial system. Um, the module is obviously here as well as the recording. If if you want to go back and, and ask more questions about the financial system and the different parts. Um, but thank you. Thank you all for being here and hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Uh, Thank bye. you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Thank bye. You. bye, Jackie. Thank you.